basically the menisci they are disks of fibrocartilage which is interposed between the femoral condyle and the tibial plateau the medial tibial plateau as you can see it is longer in the anterior posterior plane in comparison to the lateral tibial plateau the central portion of the plateau they are void and it represents the articular area and the lateral meniscus plateau is almost circular and it is less concave whereas the medial one is concave but then the superior surface of the lateral surface is not uh, very concave the menisci covers around two thirds of the, the preferred two thirds of the tibia it deepens the articular surfaces and stabilizes the joint the upper surfaces of menisci are concave whereas the under surfaces are flat peripherally the menisci thickens and it gets attached to the synovium and capsule Centrally, centrally, the border of the menisci they are thin and it exists as a free edge. The length of the medial meniscus that is around three point five centimeters, and the anterior horn of the medial meniscus is just attached to the tibial plateau, just anterior to the attachment of the ACL. And some of the posterior fibers from the anterior horn it traverses and crosses the joint. and gets attached to the lateral meniscus and this is called the transverse ligament the transverse ligament the posteriorly the medial meniscus is anchored to intercondylar fossa and then that lies between your pcl and the lateral meniscus attachment and along its periphery the medial meniscus is attached to the joint capsule and the deep mcl and as far as the mobility is concerned the medial meniscus is less mobile whereas lateral meniscus is more mobile almost 10 mm of excursion is done by the lateral meniscus from flexion to extension here you can see the excursion on the lateral meniscus the average excursion is around 11 mm and the medial meniscus average excursion is around 5 mm so as i already told you the lateral meniscus is circular covering larger portion of the articular surface and as for the width of the anterior and posterior part it is almost similar the lateral meniscus the posterior and anterior part their width are similar and the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus gets attached near the intercondylar spine posterior to the attachment of the acl here is the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus whereas the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus gets attached to the posterior intercondylar spine which is anterior to the attachment of the medial meniscus the lateral meniscus is not attached to the lcl but it has got loose attachment or is loosely attached to the synovium along the much of its length there are two ligaments the anterior and posterior menisco femoral ligaments which are known as humphrey and the risberg ligament which lies or attaches from the posterior horn of lateral meniscus it extends back and anterior and posterior to the pcl it gets attached on the medial femoral condyle here you can see one of the menisco femoral ligament Risberg. The tendon of popliteus muscle. It on its way to the lateral condyle. It crosses the joint through a hole in the lateral meniscus, and that hole is called the hiatus popliteus or the popliteal hiatus. This area along the popliteal hiatus, that is a avascular area. Here you can see some of the structures on the lateral posterior lateral to the stabilizers of the posterior lateral area. now the vascular vascular anatomy of the meniscus it is relatively avascular it having a peripheral limited blood supply and the supply is by the superior and the inferior genicular arteries it forms a premeniscal capillary plexus and from there radiating arteries or the radial branches extends inside the menisci the radial branches and as far as the penetration is concerned the on the medial meniscus side around 10 to 30 percent of the periphery of the medial meniscus is penetrated by these radial branches while on the lateral meniscus it is about 10 to 25 percent and one point to be noted that the vascularity of the outer thirds the vascularity of the outer thirds that is maintained almost throughout the life and very little changes with the age the microscopic anatomy if it is considered the menisci are composed of water around 65 to 75% collagen 20 to 25% and the non collagenous substances which comprises of proteoglycans like um, uh, matrix glycoproteins and elastin that comprises 5% 
as far as the collagen network is concerned it is having a very complex orientation the layers of the mesca if they are considered there are three layers the superficial layer lamellar layer and the deep uh, central layer the superior or the superficial layer that is in contact with the tibial and the femoral articular surfaces the fibers of collagen they are very randomly arranged and they are mixed with the lubricating layer of the proteoglycans which allows them a low frictional surface beneath this superficial layer lies the lamellar layer it has got an external area and an internal area the external area consists of radially oriented collagen fibers which intersects with the internal fibers at various angles creating a mesh the vertical fibers in lamellar layer projects into the projects into the central main layer securing them together and also helps in the transmission of force between the two in the central layer the radially oriented fibers are known as the tie fibers they can also integrate with the lamellar layer through perpendicular branches the tie fibers holds the circularly oriented circumferential collagen fibers which are found basically in the periphery of the central main layer now the tie fibers increases from anterior to the posterior region in its uh, numbers which increases its stiffness the circumferential fibers are larger bundles and comprises mainly of the tycon collagen and majority of them are located in the internal and external circumference of the menisci the radial tie fibers the purpose of it is it resists the splitting of the circumferential fibers and it may contribute to the compressive properties of the menisci the circumferential fibers undergoes a great tensile or hoop stresses when they are loaded axially now coming to the biomechanical properties of the menisci the first and foremost property is its viscoelasticity uh, they are considered the menisci are considered viscoelastic what does it mean it means that through out an applied load they exhibit two types of properties one is viscous and the other is elastic now the transition between them is time is the time dependent in nature it begins with the elastic phase and then it shifts to the viscous phase while it is being loaded so the elastic quality of the menisci or the solid phase of the menisci that is governed by your collagenous proteoglycan structure whereas the viscous or the fluid phase is due to the permeability and the water content of the menisci now what happens fluid is slowly extruded out this accommodates the compressive load without excess deformation and that lets the beginning of the viscous phase and this is a very important characteristic of the tissue permeability what happens the important characteristic is that the fluid uh, through the interconnected pores between the solid matrix of the menisci and the synovial space there has to be a clear permeability of the fluid from the solid matrix to the synovial space now when it is compressed the menisci is being compressed under compression the meniscal permeability determines the rate at which the fluid will be extruded out this meniscal permeability is much lower in comparison to the articular cartilage thus giving it the ability to maintain its shape during axial loads and what happens during the gait phase the gait the stance and swing phase especially in the uh, the heel strike or the the moment the uh, stance phase what happens the menisci maintains their load bearing capacity and it resists the fluid loss and maintains its shape if the menisci could not maintain their shape that would be essentially a non functional menisci the viscoelastic property of the menisci plays a role in the compressive resisting forces now when the constant load is applied to the knee joint the initial compression on the menisci that is resisted by the elastic property of the collagen bundle and matrix now following this initial load there is a diminished rate of compression when the fluid phase begins to take over now as the fluid is extruded out the compressive load is resisted and this is called the creep at this phase the menisci relaxes and the load needed to maintain that 
even held compression decreases and this is known as the stress relaxation phase so the creep and stress relaxation phase is very important for the men's sky now as the compression force is applied the circumferential tension develops and this leads to the hoop stresses the menisci gets extruded peripherally due to the wedge shape causing the radially oriented tangential force now this peripheral extrusion is prevented by the anterior and posterior meniscal attachment that is the anterior and the posterior root the attachment the hoops the hoop stresses allows distribution of stress over a larger area of the articular surface and this is an important function of the menisci where it is considered that it distributes the load that is due to the hoop stresses because it is getting distributed the force is getting distributed now the radial fiber the if if, if there is a radial tear this can disrupt the circumferential fiber and that can lead to the loss of the hoop stresses resulting into a dysfunctional meniscus now it is also said the posterior horn of the medial meniscus has got a higher aggregate modulus than the rest of the menisci and maybe this is because this may be because this region undergoes highest compressive stress and is most commonly injured site here you can see the axial load and which is getting transferred to the circumferential fibers through this radial tangential forces now the response to tension what is the tension tension means it is a behavior of any tissue to the stretching force and when the stretching force is applied that the effect is elongation so how much uh, resistance to elongation is there for the tissue so that is called tension so when the menisci undergoes tensile forces the initially there is very little force needed to elongate the menisci because the collagen fibers are relaxed now after this Uh, initial relation the, after this there is a linear relationship between the elongation and the load applied and after that there is a dip in the elongation where the fibers fails and it begins to tear now what is the, the maximum load which the menisci can bear that is known as the ultimate tensile load the tensile properties can change depending on the location of the menisci in the superficial layer there is no differences in the tensile strength but in the deeper layers the central in the central uh, layer that is the deepest layer the circumferential fibers have got a greater tensile modulus than the tie fibers now if the middle meniscus is considered the highest tensile modulus lies in both the anterior as well as the posterior region and studies have shown that the lateral meniscus the reports are showing that the posterior part of the meniscus is having a higher tensile modulus but other studies are showing that there is no difference between the Uh, tensile modulus both in the anterior as well as posterior region. In general, it is said that the menisci have got a, a tensile modulus of around 150 megapascals. ACL has got it around 200 to 300 megapascals. Polyethylene has got around 1000 megapascals, and the radial fibers has got a mean of 11 megapascals. The last one is the response to the shear. now what is shear shear stiffness it gives the measure of the materials resistance to changing shape the menisci have got low shear stiffness relative to cartilage which is having almost more than uh, over more than 100 times more shear resistance so the low shear stiffness allows the menisci to maintain an optimal congruency between the tibia and femur throughout the range of motion thus ensuring even load distribution Additionally, the tie fibers it segregates the circumferential fibers. This also contributes to a the low shear modulus of the menisci. Now, the shear modulus is found to be lowest in the posterior portion of the medial meniscus. Now comes the clinical biomechanics. So, what is the menisci functioning as? It is basically a spacer, like a spacer between the femoral and the tibial plateau. femoral condyle in the tibial plateau the if the menisci are removed the amount of narrowing that can be there that would be around 1 to 2 mm the joint becomes very close to each other and if the lateral meniscus is taken now the consequence is much bad in comparison to the extension of the medial meniscus now during extension 
zero degree of extension among 50 about 50 percent of the compressive load is transmitted through the meniscus in zero degree of extension which increases to around 85 percent when it is at 90 degree of flexion and the meniscus increases the contact area to around 2.5 times uh, dr manish sorry uh, i request you to uh, quickly wind up uh, the presentation in next uh, one or two minutes if possible Okay, how long is just, this? Last yeah, just three, okay, just okay, three, three. Three. just three to four slides. Okay, okay, quickly wind up, please. Yeah, I already told you this is a very boring topic. <laughs> the lateral meniscus, the, about the range of movement, if you can see, the range of movement is around 10 millimeters in the AP direction, and this mobility is explained by the close attachment of the anterior and posterior arms, and there's a lack of attachment of the capsular ligament on the posterior lateral aspect. Where the medial meniscus is more firmly attached to the tibial condyle by the deep MCL, while the lateral meniscus is relatively mobile. And this can be one factor which makes medial meniscus a more important stabilizer. As the, as the knee flexes, the menisci moves posteriorly. And during extension, the menisci are pulled forwards by the meniscopatellar fibers, which are stressed by the anterior movement of the patella, and this draws the transverse ligament forwards. Whereas the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus is also pulled anteriorly by the tension developed in the meniscofemoral ligament as the PCL becomes taut. The medial meniscus shares around 60% of the weight of the medial compartment. Lateral meniscus shares 70%. The larger contact area is provided by the menisci, which reduces the average contact stress by, between the joint surfaces. Even if we remove around 15 to 34% of meniscus, this can increase the contact stress by around more than 350%. The medial contact area reduces by 20% after removing 50% of the posterior segment of medial meniscus, and which can uh, lower down to 54% after total meniscectomy. The medial contact stress increases from 24% after 50% meniscectomy and 134% after total meniscectomy. After total lateral meniscectomy, the result can be 45 to 50% reduction in the total contact area and 235 to 335% percent in, uh, increase in the peak local contact stress. The peak contact stress is directly proportional to the amount of the meniscus removed. Now, there is a condition called PCL meniscectomy. What is that? What is that? That happens during PCL ruptures, there is an increase in the posterior tibial translation which leads to uh, the loss of the weight bearing portion of the meniscus being out of the uh, low transmission area. So that is not able to bear the weight and that is considered as PCL meniscectomy. So lastly, finally it comes to what is the basic function of the meniscus. So it acts as shock, shock absorption, load transmission, secondary restraint, role in proprioception and joint lubrication. Once the menisci were considered to be vestigial tissue. So what can be the take home message? The take home message is that tissue was, which was once considered to be vestigial has been proven to be very important. Very difficult to replicate or duplicate the function of menisci provided by the nature. So hence think twice before removing even a small piece of meniscus until unless it is absolutely essential. And if you can't make a situation better, do not do further harm. Primum non nocere. Thank you.